research has been uh, conducted in this uh, framework, but I will elaborate uh, more in depth later on. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you specifically to the key to the keynote speakers, uh, interviewees, peer reviewers, and also, of course, to all participants uh, that are that are here to uh, to. Uh, in the scope of this research that has been conducted in two, in 2021. Um, uh, uh, of course, natu naturally, we will uh, share with you this research and uh, make it public uh, right after this meeting. Uh, now, uh, I, I will uh, briefly explain how this research uh, has been, uh, as, as is, a, is a composed, it is composed of three distinct section. First, an overview of uh, the of uh, the pair of uh, the Sofia and Berlin summits that uh, took part in the frame of the planning process in a tour in a 2020 and 2021. Then uh, uh, there is an analysis of uh, the progress made against commitments. Uh, uh, on, a, on a key Berlin process topics. Uh, and uh, and uh, finally, it uh, discusses the future and uh, set out recommendations in this regard. Now, without further ado, I will leave my colleague Astrid uh, for a uh, for, uh, welcome remark. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Jules, and thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Um, you know, uh, taking time from your precious agendas and, and work that, that you may be doing in priorities is really uh, something that we are grateful to all of you. Um, I will say a couple of words, and I think, you know, more to emphasize um, why did we um, establish a regional civil society organization called Civil Society Platform for Democracy and Human Rights? One, and why specifically we are conducting research and then engaging in advocacy with all those stakeholders involved in the burning process. Uh, but in both of these, like on the Civil Society Platform, my colleague Jules will elaborate a bit more. And then on the findings and the recommendations of this research, uh, the other colleagues um, will do um, uh, provide a, a more elaboration um, right after the keynote speakers. So our motivation really to engage in the Berlin process was that we believe and we continue to believe that it has a really massive potential. As you may remember, in the uh, Berlin process statement right after the first meeting, let's say like that summit in Berlin in 2014, when it was announced, um, it said that it aims to make additional real progress in the reform processes in the Western Balkans in resolving outstanding bilateral and internal issues and in achieving reconciliation within and between the societies in the region, to then continuing to also enhance regional economic cooperation and lay the foundations for sustainable growth. So I think this was you know, an inspiration, if you will. But similarly, we were encouraged by the commitments made uh, by the uh, Western Balkans leaders to achieve this and also to go beyond it and advance respect for democracy, for rule of law, human rights, fight against corruption and organized crime, and also pledging to advancing gender equality and the rights of minorities. The third group of actors, if you will, um, that was in, uh, an encouragement for us were the EU institutions and the member states who have been supporting the Western Balkan countries and reaffirming their commitments 
to, a region, to an inclusive regional cooperation and strengthening good neighborly relations, including with the EU member states, and then putting emphasis on empowering civil society and independent and pluralistic media as crucial components of any democratic system, particularly given the worrying trends that we have been witnessing for quite a while on shrinking space for both. Now, what we wanted to do and continue to demonstrate is that we are demonstrating that at least civil society shows, uh, 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 demonstrates that we are united by the shared desire for peace and stability in the region and a common interest in taking our place in the EU, uh, European, European Union family, one. And then second, that we are here to turn words into action and we are committed to working with governments, with the EU institutions and member states to fulfill the aspirations of the citizens of the region, the full integration of Western Balkans countries into the EU. And also to help our governments fulfill their commitments, not just to the Berlin process pledges that they have been making, uh, making since 2014, but to evolving a shared world of peace and prosperity for all in the Western Balkans. But what drove our motivation was also that while we are encouraged in the progress that was made as part of the Berlin process, for which our Sil and Daniel will uh, speak more about, we are also disappointed that we are witnessing since then, that there is a rising ultra-nationalist, that, the, that there is hateful rhetoric, there is democratic decline, rise of authoritarian tendencies, and hybrid attacks on democracy throughout the region. That we see lack of a clear governance structure within the Berlin process, and there is weak institutional memory, and there are fluctuations in the priorities of leading states. But also that we recognize that both Berlin process and for that matter, the EU enlargement are at the crossroads. While the Berlin process complements the EU integration process, though not formally uh, as part of it, we see or we assess that any progress or stagnation in one will potentially have a profound impact on the other. So we believe that the, both these processes go hand in hand. And at the same time, what we are witnessing is that governments in the Western Balkans countries are failing to deliver on commitments made during the summits. And we are seeing that their actions at times are in contradiction with the pledges that they are making within the Berlin process and in contradiction with the European values, including EU integration and accession processes. So there is plenty of evidence that governments in the Western Balkan countries, uh, Western Balkan countries are pursuing still a policy of making pledges, making commitments, but at the same time going against the spirit of exactly what they pledge to do. What we are also witnessing is that EU is failing to deliver on its promises made to the Western Balkans countries and societies, such as starting accession talks with Albania and North Macedonia and providing visa liberalization for Kosovo, despite the progress made by the former and all of the visa liberalization benchmarks fulfilled by Kosovo. By not delivering on its promises, the EU is seriously undermining its credibility in the Western Balkans and the trust and hopes that citizens in the region have placed in the EU. Also failing to make the EU integration of the Western Balkans a strategic priority, followed by convincing evidence 
that go beyond the repeated commitments will expose the region to further threats and vulnerabilities and will very likely lead to citizens in the Western Balkan countries, Western Balkan countries losing faith. And I think we are witnessing decline in that. In which case, then it becomes irrelevant whether broken promises and limited progress or whether citizens in the regions were ill-informed, placed high hopes or had false expectations with regards to the EU's role in the Western Balkans and or whether EU integration prospects for the region are real or more distant than they used to be. Another complexity um, is the uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine. And I think that has exposed the vulnerabilities that the region has. I think that that is something that has not been addressed the bilateral disputes are not being tackled uh, within the Berlin process as the pledges were made. And that provides space and that provides opportunity from external actors, one, but also from, I can say without hesitation, irresponsible political leaders in the Western Balkans to push their agendas and then uh, strengthen their patronage networks, um, allow this democratic decline and authoritarianism to grow along with the nationalism that has almost brought the Western Balkan region to the brink of a repeated violent conflict. And I think we just have to look back to last year from in the second half. We've had the situation in Bosnia that still continues. I think threats are real. Threats cannot be ignored. And then we have the situation between Kosovo and Serbia where power, where muscles have been shown, where uh, fighter jets and helicopters and tanks and military has been threatening directly the peace, prosperity, and security in the Western Balkans. So we realize that our role, our influence is not significant, but we are committed once again to do our part of uh, the job and to demonstrate uni uh, unity as a civil society actors at least, um, make governments understand that we should have a more prominent role, not only in the Berlin process, but in EU and um, integration processes and NATO integration as well, even though that is not the same for all the countries of the Western Balkans. And at the same time, we want to understand better and promote better the gains that are being made in the Berlin process and EU integration process but at the same time, advocate that promises cannot be made and then broken by our governments, by the EU actors, by all the stakeholders involved in the Berlin process. So I will stop here and I will thank you once again for joining us. So, and I will kind of just hand over to Jules now so that he continues with the rest of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Astrid, for these words. Uh, very, uh, very insightful and very enlightening. Now I will hand the floor for the for the first introductory keynote speech uh, uh, to Her Ex Excellency Mrs. Mimosa Armetai, former ambassador to the Republic of Kosovo in Strasbourg, France, France, uh, former ambassador to the EU in, in uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and NATO and also from Ambassador to Slovenia. Um, Thank you very much, Jules. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, nice to be part of this initiative organized by the Balkan Forum. I just, after everything that uh, Gazmin has uh, uh, spoke about, uh, I would just like to shed a light a bit over the history, how this idea, in fact, came 
to fruition and uh, how it was initiated. In fact, um, after Croatia joined the European Union in 2013, uh, it was more than obvious that uh, the rest, six Western Balkan countries who were in the path in the path to get um, in the path of accession to the EU, um, it was more than clear that it will take a bit of time until they really join the European Union. Each and every country was in a different uh, phase, or better saying, in initial phase of joining the EU with uh, many outstanding issues, disputes, unresolved uh, questions. Therefore, the um, uh, Commission for European Union, Commissioner for Enlargement, in fact, Stefan Füle back then and his team, thought that um, there should be an idea um, uh, which could in a way contribute as a complementary to the accession process, um, uh, like a strengthening cooperation between Western Balkan countries. In fact, the idea was how to, um, how to contribute to the infrastructure and to the energy, because these were two key issues to um, the most sensitive issues. I remember officials traveling from, let's say, uh, from uh, Pristina to Sarajevo, we always had to go through either Vienna or through uh, Istanbul in order to get to the destination, taking into consideration all these issues, all these obstacles. Then the commission thought that this connectivity agenda might contribute to uh, to simplify the whole process and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, while countries are in a process of accession, uh, also um, uh, uh, restructure their infrastructure and also, uh, and also establish a connection related to the energy and the communication. I remember that um, uh, in the very beginning, it was a major debate whether this is a new Yugoslavia and uh, all countries were very much uh, um, reluctant that we don't want to go again back to Yugoslavia because we were happy to get rid of it. In the very beginning, the idea was that there should be six plus two countries, not only six Western Balkan countries, but Slovenia and Croatia as well. Uh, but uh, since they joined uh, the European Union, Union and the NATO, they withdraw. So the idea remained only within six uh, Balkan countries. And again, I'm saying it was a major debate whether we should stick to this idea because everybody was uh, afraid that uh, this might be like a way out from the accession process and it might be something else and not something that we are, were committed to follow and that was accession to the European Union. However, I, I also recall um, many details of uh, long debates and discussions that we had in Brussels, including the, the logo. Whenever I see the logo, I remember the uh, huge debate over the map and over the borders, which were uh, drawn back then, and uh, the discussion about the borderline between Kosovo and Serbia, which was not something that we wanted. It took us a bit of time to see the map, that the logo that exists now without any borders in between, because that, uh, that also created um, a major um, debate and ma major discussion. Nevertheless, um, after long discussions and everything, it was agreed that we should continue and um, like besides technical, technical debates and discussions, we agreed to have this and to work on this idea and with the only aim to advance, as I said, infrastructure projects, to work on infrastructure projects as well as, as energy over the years. Then after it was, um, the idea was how to involve also European Union uh, country, uh, countries. And the most important thing was how to have Germany on board, taking into consideration that Germany was a key and continues to be a key country in the Balkan. Um, I mean, um, when we speak not only about political influence, but also uh, due to the fact that it is economically a major investor uh, in the region. That was the idea um, to have Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel part of the initiative so she can uh, run the show in a way and uh, this uh, um, 
this initiative uh, have a brand Berlin process. That's how it got the name. That's how then it was agreed that the process will be from the summit will be from one country to the other country every single year organized in different countries. So not only Berlin itself, but also Paris and other countries joined it as uh, as idea. As, uh, as initiative, it was uh, good again, because it has also a financial component, which is not always the case with other initiatives that follow later on. And I remember when we discussed in Brussels, like which projects should be financed for Kosovo, um, like highways, uh, motorways, uh, railway roads, uh, airport, uh, this and that. And it was a long list of different projects projects that we had in plan. These were like a project discussed and debated with the line ministries, each and every one. After it was launched in, in Berlin, um, uh, there were uh, three um, addition components added to the, to, to the idea um, how to integrate youth and civil society as a ground floor, if I may, may put it in a different way than the second one where um, government ministries, line ministries that were involved. And the third level was uh, like a summit where uh, heads of the states took part. Basically, this was um, the very beginning of the initiative, uh, supposed to be the one which will contribute enormously to um, many projects and not only um, aiming to bring the region together, uh, connect it, but to also uh, serve as, uh, as a process that will uh, reconcile the, all, all the countries in the Western Balkans. And um, so the, on the day when they will become a member states in the European Union, they will be an added value and not a burden to the budget. And the coming to the European Union as a burden uh, with uh, all disputes and unresolved issues. Nevertheless, all these years, so it's um, uh, after all these years, we don't really see it being fully functional and being very productive. However, I'm looking forward to hear from other participants, how do they see it as a project from uh, then and now? And I know that it was a major debate whether this uh, process should end up or whether this process exists, in fact, because it proved not to be very fruitful and not very successful. Nevertheless, I will quit and I will stop in here uh, and uh, um, hear from other participants and maybe uh, give my contribution uh, further uh, with uh, debate. Thank you very much for inviting me and looking forward to a further discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Zamezel, for this uh, for this work. Now it is my great pleasure to give the floor to Minister Frank Moravis, Special Coordinator for the Activities of the, of the first French German Youth Office in Southeast Europe, and also Managing Director at the Pro Bordo Factory, a, a partner of the Balkan Forum with whom we have activities. Thank you very much. Hello, Herr Moravitz, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your invitation. Hello to all of you and, the organ and thank you for the organization of this important discussion and conference uh, to the team of the Balkan Forum, especially to Astrid Strefi and Jules Stifler. Uh, just one remark, I'm at the moment in Berlin and uh, in a conference of young people from the Western Balkans from all six countries and Germans and French. And we discuss the question of nationalism and populism. Uh, following these discussions, this conference is now, is the third day now, following these discussions it becomes more and more clear that this is really a very, very central issue. And also when we discuss now about the future of the Berlin process, I think um, it's clear that in all our countries, this topic uh, is from a high importance. I would like to preface this by saying that I am always very, very grateful to the Berlin process, which is not surprising at all, because one of the most important concrete and visible results of the Berlin process is the establishment of the Regional Youth Cooperation Office, RICO, 
It was signed by the six prime ministers in 2016 during the Western Balkan summit in Paris. RICO, allow me to say that, is more than a youth office. It stood, and I hope it still stands, for a political will at the highest political level to work together in the region and to give especially young citizens the opportunity to get to know each other, to form their own opinion about their neighbor, to get to know and to learn about the reality and everyday life of young citizens in the neighboring country, to work together peacefully and to discuss common challenges in their societies together. Participation is in such an exchange program especially the personal experience, cannot be valued enough. It's an experience that enables young people to look critically at nationalism, hate speech in the media, or manipulation of the history, or positively how to create and how to strengthen democratic societies. Unfortunately, I can, it can be observed that the political will for really real regional cooperation, uh, and Astrid already uh, said something about that in the, in the beginning, in the opening words, has partially decreased, or it's limited on just on certain fields. Therefore, with regard to the Berlin process and the future of the Berlin process, allow me to make three short remarks in the 10 minutes I have here. First, the Berlin process. I share your opinion that the Berlin process has a great potential, but it would have to renew itself and include the new context in Europe. Russians, Russia's brutal war against Ukraine, which is against international law, it's a deep cut for all of us in Europe as a whole. It's a war not only against Ukraine, she is, Ukraine is a hostage, it's a war against Western values, against the idea of democracy, against pluralism, freedom of expression, rule of law, and international order and law. At present, in re re response to this war, unity and close cooperation in the West is invoked. And it's necessary. We must realize that democracy does not fall from the sky and means a lot of, lot of work and effort and a clear attitude, democratic attitude. Real regional cooperation between the countries of the Western Balkans and the process of European integration and accession process of the countries in the region with the European Union are two sides of the same coin. It's a political decision and political stance for democratic values and against the nationalism that has no interest in a peaceful coexistence with, it, with its neighbor that sows fear and doubt and arrest and abuses history for its own political power, preser preservation and advantage. It's a political decision for the stronger participation of young citizens in the building of democratic societies, for pluralistic values, for stronger parliaments, and for a self-critical examination of difficult and painful history and against the manipulation and abuse of history, against nepotism and the lack of critical ma media. It's a political decision for gender equality and for the protection of minorities and against xenophobia, against hate speech and racism. It's a political decision to deliver from the side of European Union the promises which were done. A renewed Berlin process, as it says in the analysis, must focus on issues of democracy, reconciliation, and the rule of law, and promote the European idea more strongly than before. Regional cooperation between the countries of the Western Balkan, Balkan is part of the European integration process. I would like to hear more often in the European Union that for a stable democratic European Union, we need the citizens of the Western Balkans, especially the young citizens. Second, use. The future for the Berlin process must focus especially on young citizens. More and more young citizens are immigrating from the Western Balkans because they see no future there. We discussed and worked on this topic for a long time in a project called One Way Ticket in a working group, and some of the members are here now. The question was, what needs to be done to make the countries of the Western Balkans so attractive that young people here are willing to actively engage in shaping societies democratically 
to work together across borders to address the pressing issues that affect us, all of us in Europe. The question of how Europe can live together peacefully and without war, the challenges of climate change, economic prosperity, the challenge of migration, the right of good education, to name some of them. There is a long tradition of migration and mobility in Europe. People often move to where they see a future for themselves and their families to get a good education, see opportunities for their future. Within the European Union, there is fierce competition, not even between nation, nation states, but between different regions to be attractive to young citizens. What must happen? Here is a selection of some answers from our working group. We need more regional and European youth exchange. Important regional institutions like RICO must be strongly supported. Young people must have the opportunity to meet across borders and exchange ideas, get to know each other and develop concrete steps. We need more and better political education for young people so they can civic education, so that they have a chance to find their position and role in a complex world. We need more exchange programs between universities and schools in the region and also in the area of vocational, uh, vocational training. Um, we need the clear political will to, of the governments for, demo, for democratic societies and democratic values. Without this basic political framework and political will, there's little chance. The opinions and the voice of young, young citizens must be heard. They must be included in political decision-making processes. I very often hear youth is our future. But this future begins today and not tomorrow and or the day after tomorrow. Third idea uh, the, that's about reconciliation. I think reconciliation should take a more important place in the in the in the building process. The permanent dangers of war in Europe. I mean, we are expiring it right now in Ukraine and experiences in the 90s and former Yugoslavia shows how important memory work and reconciliation work is today and everywhere in Europe, not only in the Western Balkans. It's crucial to think about how to reconcile after such terrible wars. Transparency and dialogue are indispensable elements in, rem in remembrance work and the preservation of peace. The question of what really happened and the question of justice must not be ne neglected. History is present today. It's not a decision, it's not a decoration of a society. Society that does not deal with its history will find no peace in the future. I come from Germany, from a part of Europe where until 49, there was rarely peace for longer than 30 years. After so often there were wars, and so often there were wars between France and Germany among neighbors. The enmity between France and Germany was a hereditary enmity, rooted not only in politics, but also in the media, schools, families. I'm the first in my family in the last five generations who had at least directly did not experience war. What a luck. My father was a soldier in the Second World War. He fought for a criminal regime. Today, I work with the Franco German Youth Office. Many of my friends and colleagues with whom I work every day are French. Our countries based on the Elysee Treaty are today the closest cooperation partners in Europe. One experience from the success of this Franco-German reconciliation is that only a confrontation with the painful history and memory can lead to reconciliation and cooperation. It determines the quality of tomorrow's relations. Therefore, the question of reconciliation must have a central role in Berlin process. I took out these three points from your report. I cannot uh, comment all the others, but for me, these are essential points. And uh, I thank you for the opportunity to share this with you here and uh, I'm open to our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Morelli. So for this one, indeed, yours is a is a key issue and a, and a more cross-cutting issue. So, so thank you very much. Now I will take a bit of time to, in, to introduce the context in which uh, this research uh, supported by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund has been shaped. 
So it, it has been conducted in the, in the frame of the civil society platform for democracy and human, and human rights. This is an independently organized consortium of 35 civil society actors in the, in the six countries of the Western Balkans working across borders and sectors in support of each other and government to co-develop the region united by the shared desire of peace and stability. This research is one of the actions taken within the network pages to, to conduct ongoing assessment and evaluation of progress made by the Western Balkan countries towards implementing the commitments made at the summit. As part of the planning process from, uh, from 2014 onwards, uh, it aims at mapping good practices, but also challenges and uh, existing gaps uh, and also use the lessons learned as a, as a basis for shaping new strategies and mechanisms as foreseen by the planning process summit recommendations. Thank you very much. And now I will give the floor to, uh, to, uh, to Mr. Daniel Proni and Mr. Arsul Tepeya, with whom I have the pleasure to work with in the, in a, the frame of shaping this research. But first, I will let them introduce themselves briefly. Thank you very much. As, uh, I, uh, uh, I'm sorry. They will uh, outline the methodology, the findings, and the recommendations of, this, of this research. Mr. Prony, Mr. Tepelia, you are the floor. Thank you, Jules. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, thank you for joining this uh, event today. Uh, as uh, Jules mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel Proni, and together with my uh, colleague and friend Arsi Tepelia, uh, we were engaged in the research uh, on the Berlin process, uh, covering uh, the last two summits. Uh, first, I would like to commend the work of the Balkan uh, Forum team, Astrid and Jules, uh, for keeping the discussion alive and well on a very crucial topic for the Europeanization of the region. Uh, especially in these times, as uh, previous speakers uh, described so well, uh, I hope that this work and the dedication of the Balkan Forum team uh, brings some clarity to the public discourse. Uh, we have prepared a short presentation, uh, but I'll try to be brief so we have enough time for the following discussion. Uh, as I said, the purpose of the study was to look into the developments of the Berlin process as the main platform, which is shaping regional integration, and is still keeping the EU integration dynamics alive. Uh, the Berlin process has increasingly become the main instrument which complements the official EU enlargement policy. And it is an environment uh, where the six Western Balkan countries have the chance to be proactive, uh, to be innovative, and perhaps even accelerate the process in a regional fashion. Uh, that is why it's important to maintain the, our attention towards it. And uh, that's what this research tries to do. Uh, the research itself is divided uh, into three sections. Uh, first, it provides an overview of the Berlin process uh, centered on the developments of the Sofia summit in 2020 and the Berlin summit in 2021 and how these events shaped the dynamic of uh, regional cooperation. It's particularly refreshing while we wait on news on the next summit, although this delay we're seeing on its organization might be a bit concerning. Uh, next, it analyzes the implementation prospects and track records of the commitments uh, deriving from each summit as they are set out in the declarations and uh, chair uh, conclusions. Uh, these commitments unfold in 13 topics, ranging from freedom of movement, uh, regional economic cooperation and digital, digital transformation to anti-corruption, reconciliation and environmental issues. Uh, the third and last section uh, covers recommendations addressed to different stakeholders, uh, such as national governments, European institutions, um, policymakers, and civil society. Uh, these recommendations uh, mostly focus on the future and uh, more importantly on the sustainability of the Berlin process, an issue particularly relevant considering the recent uncertainties. 
Uh, whereas regarding the methodological approach, uh, this study draws from three different sources. So we have conducted desk research and analysis of documents relevant to the two summits, uh, complemented by 17 uh, semi structured interviews with national, regional, and EU officials, uh, with researchers and experts from the region and beyond, and civil society representatives. As a last source, the research also takes note of the perspective of media and relevant uh, commentators uh, on the region. So uh, we move on to uh, the findings. I'll briefly cover a few before passing it on to Arsid for the rest of it and for the recommendations. But the first, maybe a few words on the summits themselves. Uh, both summits, uh, the Sofia one and the Berlin one, took place in two difficult years. Um, where all the countries were trying to manage the pandemic, the region as a whole. Uh, therefore, the context and the appetite for regional cooperation was not particularly encouraging, also considering the setbacks with the EU enlargement policy. But we see that the SOFIA summit in 2020 uh, actually rose to the occasion and reaffirmed the credibility of uh, the Berlin process. Uh, the major agreement on the common regional market and the green agenda for the Western Balkans were seen by all parties as very po uh, positive developments, which would uh, determine the course for regional cooperation uh, for the next few years. Whereas the Berlin summit in 2021 uh, was overall disappointing and did not introduce anything uh, particularly new. It mostly reaffirmed existing uh, commitments. However, uh, also during this period, covering the Berlin uh, summit, the work on the technical level between uh, public administrations on different issues uh, continued. Uh, so starting on a positive note uh, with the stories of success, so to say, uh, during this last two years, there were several examples which served to maintain the enthusiasm for regional cooperation. Uh, the establishment of the green lanes during the pandemic and the abolition of uh, roaming charges were deemed successful by all sides uh, involved in the process. Uh, the green lanes required a swift coordination and mobilization of all public administration in six countries, and it provided a very much needed assistance for handling the pandemic. Um, this showcases very well how uh, these countries can coordinate and uh, uh, cooperate with each other. Uh, the same could be said also for the abolition of roaming charges in, term of, in terms of its proportions and importance. Uh, both these initiatives uh, brought the region closer to the European Union. And the idea was to follow the same pattern uh, also on different areas, uh, for example, with the recognition of diplomas. But we lately see that that is being carried out to other avenues. Uh, anyway, uh, despite uh, these success stories, we see that in some areas there is room for improvement. Uh, there is an evident need to escalate efforts on digitalization and digital inclusion. Uh, digitalization remains a solid strategic objective of the region, and many initiatives are undertaken in that context. But we see that the process here is driven more by inertia than innovation. To illustrate, studies show that uh, the region still trails behind the European benchmarks in terms of digital preparedness, which in, uh, in turn uh, will hamper growth and the prospects of integration with the EU market economy. Uh, moving on to the next, uh, we see that the Berlin process, as also the previous speakers noticed, has a clear emphasis on economic convergence projects, but often lacks meaningful efforts to address governance challenges, such as rule of law issues, state capture, anti-corruption, organized crime, illicit finance, or other security threats. Uh, and as it is not noted in the research, uh, uh, in the Western Balkans, as in the European Union, uh, economic cooperation comes easier than action on political issues. But while we see some developments uh, here too, mostly regarding the coordination of national authorities to tackle certain matters or for awareness raising purposes, a, syst a systemic and structured approach is mainly lacking in, 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 to tackle the issues of rule of law and anti-corruption on a regional level using the Berlin process as a platform. And the importance of addressing these issues cannot be overstated for a region where, according to the Balkan uh, Barometer, an initiative of the Regional Cooperation Council, a large ma ma majority of the surveyed think that the law is not applied equally or effectively. 
Uh, it is important also to work on these indicators to make sure that economic projects such as the common regional market, uh, which are undeniably crucial, are not undermined and do not actually serve to, in fact, further deepen the existing social and uh, economic inequalities in the region. Uh, whereas regarding uh, civil society, uh, we see that the practice of meeting annually in the margins of the uh, Berlin process uh, proceedings uh, continues. Uh, however, despite the fact that it, it is more organized and it is more structured now, uh, we see that civil society representatives often struggle to communicate with policy policymakers or the structures of the Berlin process. Uh, this in turn may have caused a lower enthusiasm for CSOs, for civil society organizations to engage um, in the process, despite them being the main instrument for monitoring the Berlin process, for ensuring its accountability, and for producing alternative uh, studies, reports, and analysis. So overall, there is uh, much scope to include civil society much more systematically in the main proceedings of the Berlin process, whether it be by um, piloting co-chairing uh, schemes or for a dis uh, having a discussion during the plenary session, the main proceedings on recommendations coming from civil society. And finally, uh, I would have to mention that as previous uh, speakers stated, the work of RICO on youth has been uh, commendable to include youth in the reconciliation processes as a first step. And uh, however, this youth structure has um, untapped potential to develop innovative ideas, which would push the region towards a deeper Europeanization. Uh, okay, so now I will pass it on to Arsid uh, for his part on the rest of the findings and the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for this event and, and for uh, giving us the opportunity to share with you uh, our part of the research. And uh, I'll go on by presenting the uh, next our next finding, uh, which is about the common regional market, and uh, we regard it as a as a new era for for the regional uh, economic cooperation. Even though there has been many achievements in the past, uh, it, this, we believe, takes it to the next level. Um, it focuses and it is based on the four uh, freedoms of, uh, as in the European uh, single market. And it is uh, regarded also as an exercise before, uh, before the accession to the European Union. Um, while there has been progress on this, level uh daniel mentioned it on the the work on technical uh issues within the governments in the region has not actually stopped even during the pandemic uh the problems remain at the political level and as such uh the governments and the and the common regional market uh even though it has uh very well-built structures within the regional framework has yet failed to uh produce tangible results for, for the citizens and uh, also for the business communities. Uh, to move on to the track record of the European integration uh, process, um, we think that, uh, it was already mentioned, but we, we think that while Berlin process is a complementary vehicle for, for the enlargement policy, uh, it still is very much impacted from the uh, enlargement uh, process and uh, it has not been going well in the last years. Um, the reluctance to move forward with the process on the EU side, uh, as we said in the beginning with uh, North Macedonia, Albania and Kosovo cases, um, has probably jeopardized the, the uh, union's credibility and also its transformative power in the region. Uh, it is for this reason, but also uh, for bilater bilateral issues and um, lack of political will, that um, parallel initiatives such as uh, Open Balkans, which is a local rooted initiative, but has similar goals to the common regional market, um, has em ha have emerged in the, in the past uh, few years. Um, we are not yet sure. Uh, we we tried to, to um, examine this new initiative, but it still is not. Um, we're not sure whether it can be sustainable as it marginalizes half of 
the uh, countries in the Western Balkans, and uh, namely Kosovo, North uh, Montenegro, and uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. And um, also, we believe that uh, in turn, this pluralism. It was also uh, shared by uh, some of the interviewees. Uh, this pluralism of initiatives could probably undermine the common regional market's potential. Uh, there is not always a need to double it, and uh, there is no need to go in parallel with its aims. Uh, for the reconciliation, uh, that remains a, a key issue in the Balkans. Uh, of course, it is very complex and difficult, and we already mentioned that too. But despite being a very uh, of strategic importance, uh, still reconciliation efforts uh, are stuck, remain stuck, uh, because they within the Berlin process, at least, um, they, within this platform, they lack a cohesive strategy and methodology that will require in the future a uh, dedicated and comprehensive political engagement. But this, we believe, should also be done on a regional level and not only between uh, countries as to give, uh, as to empower also the uh, uh, regional structures and make them, give them the potential to, to uh, produce results. Uh, moving on to the recommendations that we have for stakeholders and uh, for everyone involved in the Berlin process. Uh, Berlin process needs to momentum, and this is very obvious. Uh, in, the, in the last year, probably we haven't uh, we have been hearing mostly critics about it. And uh, as I mentioned, the new initiative ha has emerged, and uh, that could be a that could be a problem, according to us, for the uh, Berlin process. And uh, it should be sustained because its mechanisms, uh, the experience and know-how built during these years, but also the political and um, technical ties among the. Uh, among the triangle, national, regional, and EU level uh, could improve and uh, should improve sustainability if they are empowered. Um, it, I, we think it could also benefit from a stronger political engagement, both on uh, the national and uh, regional levels, uh, but always coordinated by uh, regional structures and uh, that should aim to, to make the process more democratic and uh, more uh, inclusive. Uh, and this takes me to the, the next point, which is to unleash the Western Balkans civil society potential, which uh, is yet to be seen within the process. Um, and we believe that the uh, Berlin process and uh, as a platform, has the uh, can accommodate uh, the, the um, uh, contributions from the uh, civil society for the betterment of, of the initiative as a whole, but also for the regional cooperation and all its goals. Um, for such a recommendation is uh, to create a new relationship of uh, constructive dialogue and uh, enhanced mutual trust. Well, with uh, civil society and other actors uh, decision that are part of the decision making um, to enable them to become an engine of ideas and also increase accountability uh, within the, the initiatives. Uh, for this reason, communication must be improved at every level of, um, uh, of the process, uh, starting from platforms of consultation from early stages of, of the new uh, policies to the uh, full integration at uh, the high level meetings uh, and the summits. Uh, the Berlin process uh, can be also a, a platform that enables young people to connect and uh, create opportunities and also get involved in the decision making. Uh, we already mentioned RICO's work, which is a very commendable one, and uh, it can use it can be used as a, as an example and as a very good practice for other uh, youth initiatives as well, who should uh, bring uh, the, the youth closer to the uh, policy dialogue and the uh, decision making processes. Um, going to the next point. Uh, uh, 
which also is again connected to the common regional market and the green agenda the establishment of the common regional market within the um, green agenda framework uh, but this will require enhanced cooperation and synergy across the western balkans uh, it is no longer easier as the cooperation deepens it also brings uh, new challenges and uh, it requires more efforts it requires uh, political backing both at national and regional level and uh, more human resources additional human resources we have found out during the during our interviews that uh, some of the frameworks or structures within the uh, 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 regional um, framework are struggling with their human resources and they are still doing a very uh, good technical job and uh, getting goals delivered so uh that would be another issue uh and uh if if all these can be done this will accelerate the implementation of the uh, common regional market uh for um, and for a healthy space uh economic space and um also for sustainable peace and democratization within the region the berlin process should be more engaged in security information sharing and judicial cooperation this is um, this takes me also to a reconciliation issue which is the bedrock for sustainable cooperation and uh, future or, or for any future cooperation and uh, and prosperity um it is important that it remains as it was meant in the beginning of the Berlin process, uh, a central uh, issue and a central, um, point, a central point for uh, the efforts of the all actors involved to be concentrated to, with, uh, with our recommendation being that um, Western Balkans governments should be more engaged politically uh, to resolve disputes and tensions as they remain high at the moment um and this takes me to the final point of our recommendations uh about freedom of movement within the region and uh connectivity these are now regarded by uh experts and we also found out that uh, these could be easily achievable and uh low-hanging fruits someone called them but still are far from being implemented uh it, they have there have been, of course, uh, progress uh, on green establishing green lanes and also uh, connectivity. But the next step should be going beyond the region and uh, seek ties uh, also inside the European Union space. And uh, on this last recommendation, I will conclude uh, this presentation. I again wanted to thank everyone for being here and uh, also, uh, of course, uh, the Balkan Forum for this opportunity and uh, for, for the very smooth cooperation that we had during the research. Thank you again, and I'm looking forward to the uh, Q&A session. Thank you very much, Arsene and Daniel. Uh, it was a very uh, clear and detailed uh, presentation, so, so congratulations. Uh, now uh, I am... Uh, I am uh, ready to answer any any question you may have regarding the research uh, following this presentation. If uh, uh, if uh, not, um, um, I will uh, I will. Uh, I will uh, thank everyone uh, for uh, uh, having joined us today, and uh, and uh, we uh, we will uh, provide you with uh, with the research right away. And uh, and uh, once again, thanks. thank you very much for your participation. Uh, bye bye. Have a nice. Uh... Ah, excuse me. Excuse me. I'm very sorry. One question. Yes, please. Indeed, that was not a raised hand. I just wanted to compliment all of you about the work and the findings. So I am Matilda from Regional Youth Operation Office. Uh, it's really great. And so it's good that we're going to have also the, the, the let's say, the findings in uh, 
Rita and I was about to ask when is the presentation to be public also, but uh, yeah, you also mentioned that, that you're gonna send it. It's really great to, to hear whatever was elaborated here about all the context of the Western Balkans where we are now, the challenges, recommendations, and very good points that were indeed uh, highlighted one more time and figured out. So congratulations to everyone. You should be proud for the work uh, that you have already done. Uh, thank you very much. It was a uh, surely the teamwork, and uh, and uh, we are not very uh, we are not very. Uh, 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 actually, this is a launching event uh, of uh, the research of the research. It was not called as such, but uh, it is. Uh, uh, I see another hand. Uh, François. François. Uh, François, please. Uh, thank you, Gilles. Uh, uh, I think this is a, a, a very good uh, uh, work, initiative, and, and, uh, and presentations. I would not, not like to uh, cut a little bit the, uh, the atmosphere, but I would like to, to do two or three remarks, if, if you, if you uh, allow me, in order to have a discussion uh, among us, because the people are, are shy to, to do not uh, speak or, or, or question. The first one is... Um, I'm a bit uh, upset by the fact that we are always saying that the European Union uh, is not delivering the promise. Uh, and to be fair with the European Union, uh, we should say that uh, currently this is one member state, and we can even name it, uh, which is blocking the process of uh, two uh, candidates, Albania and North Macedonia, in order to uh, progress to start the negotiations and, and to move forward. So this is not the European Union as a such, uh, because the European Union in March 20 has decided uh, in the decisions, uh, in the conclusion of the, of the, of the European Council uh, to start the negotiation with uh, these two countries. Uh, and th there is just now the need to uh, get an agreement on the negotiation framework. So maybe, because this is important to have a, a clear debate and the youth and what you're doing is essential for the process. I, 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 I would like to stress this. Uh, this is also nice to explain concretely that for the moment, currently there is one member state blocking uh, two and, and it has an impact, I would say, on the uh, enlargement negotiation. So that's, that's one. Two, I would like also to um, uh, make sure that we understand that the, the European integration process and the enlargement process uh, is uh, something different than the Berlin process. Berlin process is uh, something in terms of cooperation. So that means that everybody has to agree on the decision. The European integration process is something completely different. And uh, from the start, it was clear, at least in a certain number of, of member states, that the Berlin process is something which is not linked directly to the European integration and to the enlargement process. So this, it was a kind of uh, momentum to progress towards, but not in, in the same way. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, you are all uh, very young and you could do some, some work on, on that. Uh, there is a reflection to have on the, what does it mean to become member of the European Union? I mean, uh, we have mentioned that in terms of Franco-German and it was very well done by uh, Mr. Moravietz and uh, uh, the Ophage is, is uh, still something which is useful for that in terms of reconciliation, a change and so on and so on. But the point of the European integration process is to share sovereignty, even sometimes to transfer sovereignty to a supranational level. And this is the case for at least now for uh, main uh, policies. When we are talking about the monetary policy, this is not anymore any member states which is deciding what's going on at this level. This is the ECB. So that means a supranational authority. Ask the Germans how it was difficult to abandon the marks at a certain point in order to get the euro. That's transfer of national sovereignty. The same with the competition policy, 
The same with the uh, CAP, and it was more for the French that it was done in such a way a uh, long time ago, and the same in terms of uh, trade policy. For all the other policies, this is a mix between supranational decision-making process and uh, member states. The Berlin process is something completely different. So we have to be clear that when we are asking the Balkans, the Western Balkans, to become member, to, to be in this journey of becoming member of the European Union, they have to keep in mind, and I'm not sure that this is what we are doing enough, they have to keep in mind, I mean, the governments, that at a certain point, they will have to transfer national sovereignty. And the main problems now in all these member countries, I mean, the six, that they, they, sti they are still not ready of, of doing that because of the history, because of where they are coming from, because of the wars, because of the, the conflict, the dispute and whatever. But they are still not ready to give pieces of their national interest, national sovereignty to supranational institutions that we have, we, we can discuss about the legitimacy, uh, the, democrat, the democratic process, if it should do better and so on. Okay. The point is to make sure that these governments in the regions are aware that becoming member of the European Union or engaging this journey will mean that. And why sometimes in the member states, the current one, this is difficult to make some progress? Because already within the European Union, we have a certain number of member states which are forgetting that. And I'm talking, we can discuss about Hungary, we can discuss of Poland, and they consider that the national sovereignty, the national interest is much in, more important than the collective, I mean, the European Union uh, supranational level. So maybe we have also, and the youth, uh, because you, you, you are uh, uh, doing a very good job and you, have, you are working and trying to explain and try to move forward in order to make sure that this region is becoming part of the, of the European family, we have to, to do this learning process, to, to do this um, uh, education process also to our governments and to the governments and to explain that, yes, uh, we have to make some efforts, but the, the, the logic behind is an important one. This is transfer or at least the share, the sovereignty, which is not easy. This is not easy. I mean, we can see that in the election in France. We can see that in, in all the elections. There are uh, 40, 50 percent of all the population in every country which doesn't want, they don't want to do that. But this is the, the main uh, philosophy of the European integration. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lafont, for this uh, for this uh, for this uh, very well explained reminders. And uh, yeah, we cannot deny that uh, even within the EU, uh, we have some uh, uh, issues in this regard. This is uh, undeniable, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, can I, uh, can I just add something to, to keep the conversation going uh, with uh, Monsieur Lafont? Or is it okay? Or if anyone else wants to speak? No, please, uh, please do. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your remarks and also for the uh, advices. I very much appreciate it. And also, uh, thank you for the compliments on our work. Uh, yeah, uh, it's actually this issue of blocking the integration process. Uh, I very much agree with you that it should not, it's not always the uh, European Union and its institutional structure to be blamed. But it is still um, it, it, very frustrating for us on, on the Western Balkans. And it is also a matter of uh, this being this nameless uh uh, country, the, the country that should not be named. It's just the last episode in a long series of uh, blockings for the uh, for the integration process. Uh, we, as I already mentioned, the case of Kosovo on the visa liberalization, and also the fact that uh, they, they have been struggling for that since 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then there is um, uh, the case with. Albania and North Macedonia, who have received um, a green light from the European Commission since 2019, uh, 
uh, North Macedonia probably even earlier. Uh, but yet to the day, I've not formally opened uh, or not sitting on the negotiation table. Uh, and that's, uh, yes, of course, it is not, um, there are um, probably more specific actors to, to be, uh, that are responsible for this, but also it, the history keeps repeating uh, and we find ourselves uh, in similar situations over and over again. And uh, moving on to the second point that you uh, mentioned about the Berlin process uh, and the European integration. Uh, yes, that too is, uh, is very true. And we, uh, we have been very careful to explain that we regard Berlin process as a complementary vehicle for uh, integration. And it's not related to the enlargement policy or the uh, external um, uh, action of, on, of the European Union. Uh, but this new approach of a regional cooperation has uh, recently become uh, has become also the approach of the European Commission. Of course, European Commission is part of the. Uh, Berlin process. Uh, it's, it has supported recently the common regional market and the green agenda, has given clear guidelines. It is also working very closely with um, regional, um, with regional uh, frameworks or structures. So um, they are very much involved in this. And uh, also the recent um, your, uh, economic and investment plan that was uh, introduced by Oliver Varheli. Sorry, it's just bad water. Uh, the economic and investment plan recently um, presented by, by Oliver Varheli is actually uh, has a very regional approach. It has 10 flagship initiatives that should be, um, uh, uh, should be active only if they are, um, they are, um, will, will become active or will. Uh, be implemented if there are regional uh, projects. So this is how um, Berlin process and EU integration are very much interlinked. And uh, it has come to a point that it is difficult to, to tell one from another. Uh, they are very much codependent right now, uh, at least in, in, in my personal regard, and I'm probably going away from the research team's opinion. but. I, but that's very interesting and we can keep talking about that uh, for much longer, but I'm not going to take much time. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Arsild. Um, I think, uh, does anyone else have a, like to jump on? Daniel? It's okay. Oh, it's fine. Please, Frank. Uh, you're more than welcome to yeah, I just would like to strengthen what uh, Monsieur Lafon uh, said. It's important um, about sharing sovereignty, and that's why I think also this question of nationalism is so important. Because my opinion is that none of the nationalist politicians in the Western Balkans are ready to share sovereignty. For sure, not. That's not in their interest. It's not their intention even, despite the beautiful uh, the beautiful speeches they have. And that's why, um, and I just would, would like to add also that this sharing of uh, sovereignty, it's not only on the European level. We are also living in a global, in a global context. And also on the global context, we have to share sovereignty more and more and take in consideration what are the positions of others. That's why it's so important also to include in all, when we speak about regional cooperation and about the regional dialogue, not only to speak about the region, it's important for sure, but also to speak about how we imagine our, our living together in Europe and in the Europeans, in the in a European society and in the global context. And that is something uh, what, uh, for example, yesterday in our seminar, the, the young people discussed. Um, and it's, it's important to see these different levels and to take that in consideration and to make it very, very clear that uh, you cannot reach this aim with, national, with nationalists, 
with politicians who are nationalists. It's impossible because these are it's completely contradictory. They will not they will not follow this way very clearly. Not. And uh, it has to be said very clearly. Uh, and the question of Ms. Lafon, uh, are you ready, are you the countries of the Western Balkans ready to share sovereignty is an um, elementary and important question. Thank you very much Frank, for this contribution. Uh, does uh, anyone else have a remark or one a concluding uh, question? If not, uh, I would like to thank you all very By the way, I, I just, sorry, I just would like to add something, um, not only to put it on the, on the level of Western Balkans. It's also a question, and it's also a permanent discussion inside of European Union, not only with Poland and with Hungary. Uh, uh, yesterday, the, the European Parliament decided to ban all uh, production of uh, cars with benzene and diesel in the European Union, forbid it. And, uh, from 2025 uh, on, I already hear the discussions now, because this had this has to be uh, this has to be then discussed in our parliament in our parliaments, and we need uh, in the end uh, the the decisions of the of the member states. But I already hear now the discussions in European Union why we give up our sovereignty to a European Parliament deciding such things. No, so just to just to say, it's not only a question sharing sharing sovereignty uh, is necessary, but sometimes it makes very painful sometimes. <laughs> so it's not only about uh, the Western Balkans; it's also a question and a topic in our countries. Sorry to jump in. No, no, uh, of course it is a it is a central front for reminding us that despite the EU is a. Is uh, somehow all the all the all the framework. It is still uh, it is still constantly uh, the object of debates and uh, uh, such as the one you, you mentioned. So it is a very nice concluding remark so that uh, that uh, we should never take things for granted and uh, that uh, and uh, that uh, discussion debate is always. Uh, there and uh, luckily always fruitful. But, yes, thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, and uh, even more for staying over time. Uh, I on a on a PM of a of a civil and Balkan forum. I would like to thank you very much for being uh, for being uh, for actively taking part in the in a, in, a, in a, the discussion either by taking the floor or in the chat. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and bye-bye. Uh,